remember I was a little kid, 11 or 12 years old, when I was watching newsreels of the uh, Paris Dakar and the East Africa rally, and I watched those uh, those stories with such amazement, and uh, I was fantasizing and dreaming about being in uh, one of those rallies one day and drive a race car across Africa. And uh, in 2004, I came really close to making my childhood dream a reality, and I wanted to enter the Dakar, and then I realized that it was really for uh, professional rally racing teams. So that's when I decided to create an amateur, kinder, gentler, friendlier, socially more responsible version of a Trans-Africa race. And that's how the Budapest Monaco was born. Every year in January, professional adventurers and amateur rally drivers gather in the Hungarian capital to set out on the world's largest amateur rally. Men, women and machines have to travel over 9,000 kilometers from Budapest across the Alps, Southern Europe, the mountains of Morocco and the Sahara to reach their destination in West Africa. The liberal rules of the rally allow anyone to enter using any type of vehicle. Each year there are some unlikely candidates attempting the Saharan crossing. This Volkswagen Beetle broke down in Europe last year and didn't even reach the shores of Africa. Her driver, who came all the way from Hawaii, seems optimistic. We're gonna make it this year. <laughs> last what? year a transmission problem. This year we're gonna make it. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. The stereo and the GPS inside this clunker are worth more than the vehicle, but its owners are determined. Entering it with the most unreliable car that we know, which is Skoda 105, and we're confident that we'll make it. I have a weak spot for old French cars. Very unlikely vehicle for this trip, but last year we had one of these Renault 4s and, and it made it. This is Louis Philippe, my trusted Peugeot 504. I've completed the route with this car uh, twice. This is going to be his third time going to, uh, to Africa. I think this will be his last voyage. At the end of the trip, I will donate it to a foundation that will help school children in uh, Guinea-Bissau attend school. For the first time, the Budapest Bamako will end in Bissau, the capital of Guinea-Bissau. At the press conference, the organizers announced that the charity goals of this year's rally far exceeded their expectations. Despite a weak economy, teams managed to raise over 700,000 euros worth of direct aid. Idén 6 darab mentőautót viszünk ki Gínába, Gínea Bissauba. Ezek az autók lesznek a legjobban felszerelt mentőautóként Gínea Bissauba. So there is 10,000 kilograms of charity presents for West Africa this year mainly. It is for schools. As you see here, there are some computers, school seats and uh, other materials and there is a big, big collection and a big uh, quantity of uh, mosquito nets. For a Norwegian trio, the rally starts 3,000 kilometers from Budapest at a Spanish warehouse. They ship their bikes here weeks earlier. So we're just waiting for Oscar to get the keys so we can get in here. <laughs> See, this is what we should have brought Africa, like a BMW 650 GS, this is what we're bringing. Adrian, Magnus and Joachim have set their goals high. They are about to complete the entire African leg of the rally on these 20-year-old Vespas. Second breakdown of the day. I uh, was driving down in here in Soita. We were trying to find a hotel and uh, my gas wire just uh, didn't work anymore. It happened to be one of those little niblets things that jumped off the, the gas wire. This, 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 is, this is the way of the wet this but you know. It's going to be a long way to Guinea-Bissau. The Budapest Bamako is a difficult challenge for all drivers. Teams in the racing category have to travel five, six hundred kilometers daily on questionable roads. Only the start and finish points are given. In addition to these, they must locate 10, 15 well-hidden navigational points each day to collect additional points. Drivers and navigators must have nerves of steel to do this day in and day out for nearly two weeks. By 4 a.m., 150 vehicles have lined up at the start line. 
By sunrise, everyone's eager to go, including the returning champions. By 10 a.m., all 450 participants from 35 countries have rolled across the start line. The Slovenian Renault 4, this funny-looking Dutch couple, and the Hawaiian Beetle have all embarked on an epic journey full of adventure and hardship. In a few minutes, Budapest will be just another stop on the way to Bissau. On the first day, teams have to drive to the Italian port city of Geneva. The 1,094-kilometer stage is driven mostly on highways across Hungary, Slovenia and Italy. While the cars are pounding the highways of Europe, the Norwegian Vespa team is on a ferry to Africa. We just left Spain, got Gibraltar over here, We've got Africa over here. A little tired, we slept maybe two, three hours last night. This is Africa. It's going to be a hell of a ride. The rest of the teams have to drive nearly 2,000 kilometers to southern Spain to ferry over to Morocco. Yeah, we got all the waypoints so far, and uh, we even got five hours of sleep last night. So we're doing a good shape. The ferry reaches the Moroccan coast at dawn. Teams disembark to begin a 700-kilometer stage across the Ref and Atlas Mountains. The pouring rain only dries up by midday, just in time for the racing teams to go off-road. The boys on the Vespas are hundreds of kilometers ahead dealing with a new set of challenges. As they get closer to the high atlas, it begins to rain, followed by hail and then snow. This is certainly not the Africa they were expecting. 1920 meters. Fucking freezing. And, uh, Snowstorm, winds all over, icy roads. Guy told us to uh, hurry up because uh, the snow is going to get worse. The storm did not get worse. It just took on a different shape as teams reached lower altitudes. About 80 kilometers from today's finish line, participants get their first bitter taste of the Sahara. They are 50 kilometers north of the famous Erk Chebi Dune system. This morning, um, about 5 a.m., 6 a.m., we were driving through the night and uh, overheated all of a sudden. But then we just decided to sleep for an hour and we got some water from the local village, so it was good. No problem after that. Day five of the rally is the longest and most demanding section of the Budapest Bamako. The adrenaline is waking teams up at 4 a.m. They have to drive nearly 800 kilometers on difficult desert tracks from the Durkwa oasis to Tata. We'll be about 10, 15 kilometers from the Algerian-Moroccan border. Currently there's a war between Algeria and Morocco and even though there are no weapons fired, uh, you will not be able to get back to the Moroccan side if they capture you in Algeria. It's 4.45 in the morning. It's Sunrise is still about two hours away. Uh, Louis Philip and I are driving on this little dirt road. Try to uh, follow the race teams who are on their way to the sand dunes of Erg Chebi. Waking camels greet me as I reach the villages surrounding the massive dunes. Erk Chebi is Morocco's largest dune field. These majestic sand hills can reach 150 meters in height 
and span an area of over 100 square kilometers. The spectacular sunrise and the lazy camels offer a stunning view on this crisp Saharan morning. But danger is never far in the Budapest Bamako. The boys on the Vespa team had to find out the hard way that riding in soft sand is not la dolce vita on these Italian city cruisers. Just fell uh, in the sand over there. It was soft and nice, so I had a little problem uh, starting the scooter again because it was sand everywhere. We finally got it to uh, to run pretty uh, pretty well and got up the hill. In addition to locating several navigational markers in the sand, teams have 800 truly difficult kilometers on today's agenda. Finding the geo points often requires stopping, getting out of the car, and continuing on foot. By mid-morning, as the sands disappear, teams can finally enjoy some speed. It's hard to believe, but we just crossed Morocco's largest river, the Draw. We're drinking part of this country. We're about uh, 20 kilometers from Zagora, where today's uh, big checkpoint is. Welcome in tomorrow in Morocco, Budapest, Bamako, Garage Ali, inshallah. This is the checkpoint for the racing category teams. It's uh, one o'clock now, and only five racing cars have passed by. He gives the stamps, the race teams. Can you check my uh, air filter? Yes, okay. Come, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. okay, okay. There is a lot of wet points we don't find. Merci. Merci. Minden nagyon szoktam volt, nagyon tetszik a BR sejlő, úgyhogy nagyon elégedettek vagyunk. Van egy kis technikai problémánk, de aztán megoldották a szerelőket körülbelül fél órás szereléssel. After visiting the bush mechanics of Zagora, cars return to the desert for another 400 kilometers of extreme driving. The boys on the Vespas play it safe and finish the rest of the day on a paved road. The last 200 kilometers of this rocky terrain completely destroy this tire. There are two major holes, two gigantic holes. This is the original jack that came with this car at 71. Every day, the machine dictates that we have to fix whatever is broken, and there's always a lot of things broken. Every day. And the thing is, I lost the first gear. And I couldn't get it in first gear, which is a big problem when we're in sand. It was gummed up with sand anyway. It's, uh, this off, off piste, all this piston driving was, uh, I think it's very bad for this group. It's, uh, it just, everything is shaking loose. This is loose. Yeah. This yeah. is loose. Yeah. <laughs> We spent another cold night here in the Sahara. We're in uh, the northern Moroccan town of Tata. Today's stage is gonna be a short but sweet 553 kilometer drive down to planet Tatooine. Where we still don't know anything about the beloved Baja Biro, the Trabant, or Little Polski. Hopefully they'll turn up somewhere along the way. The Budapest Bamako has no catering trucks. Teams have to buy their own food at the local markets, which is not always as it's simple as it seems. We got popcorn and some oranges, but there's no bread or milk today. I guess we'll just have to go to another town. 
Luckily, water is available everywhere to keep teams hydrated as they set out on yet another demanding day under the desert sun. Driving at the feet of the Bonnie Mountains. It's a gorgeous day for a drive. The weather has uh, finally gotten a little better. The sandstorm from a few days ago is only a distant memory. The race teams are still behind these huge rocky mountains. They have about 500 kilometers more to go. Teams in the touring category and those who had eaten enough dust for today can join a paved road after a while. The Vespa team avoids the dirt roads as well. After yesterday's extreme stage, they have time to relax, kick back, and enjoy a smooth ride down on the sandy but paved road. Going to be south. But today was easy. Just tarmac. It was long, but uh, it was easy. So it was really nice. We're having the time of our lives, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It requires some stamina and some uh, imagination, and then you can head out in the greatest adventure of your life. The Budapest to Bamako is a great way to do it, I think. It's an early morning on the plains of central Morocco. Although these cone-shaped structures in today's camp resemble scenes from the Star Wars movies, they're remnants of an abandoned army barrack. To people on the rally, this is Planet Tatooine. Today's stage is a difficult 553-kilometer ride to the coast and then down to Bojdur. I have about 530 kilometers ahead of me down to uh, Bojdur. Uh, most of the race teams are driving inside the Sahara on uh, punishing dirt tracks today. And punishing they are. Whether it's soft sand or sharp rocks, teams are having a tough time on this stage. By day seven of the rally, both men and machines get increasingly tired. Even the race leaders, Janos Turiani and Miklos Nud, get stuck on the sand dune. They're losing valuable time as the shifting sands blow harder. They're hoping to dig out their car by hand, knowing that it could take hours. Several kilometers north, a sharp rock destroyed one of the rear tires on the number 25 Toyota. Meanwhile, the boys in the number 14 team got their lucky break. The spirit of the rally calls for helping fellow competitors in trouble. Members of the number 62 car came to the rescue and put the 14 back in the race. sticking uh, mostly to the paved road and hopefully I'll get to camp before uh, sunset. In about 50-60 kilometers we'll be entering the occupied southern provinces of Morocco, also known as Western Sahara. Morocco has nearly 3,000 kilometers of wild coastline. Teams finally reach the Atlantic Ocean in the early afternoon. reach the Atlantic coast. This is a very happy moment always. We have about 400 kilometers more to go on this long and straight narrow road to tonight's camp. Looks like uh, we made it to today's finish line just before sunset. What a major victory for me. Looks like a lot of people are already here. Day 8 of the Budapest Bamako starts unusually early. By now, teams have settled into their routine. Brush teeth, do last-minute repairs, check race results. 
and enter coordinates in the GPS. Having ridden over 2,000 kilometers on their scooter, Magnus, Adrian, and Joachim spend the night in this hotel, some 30 kilometers from camp. They need their rest with 4,000 difficult kilometers still ahead of them. Our geography teachers never lie to us. It turns out, nights are really indeed very cold in the Sahara. It was a brutally cold night and cold morning. Uh, most of the teams have already left this scenic beach camp. We have about 500 kilometers to go today. And uh, we need to reach the Moroccan Mauritanian border. I believe Philip is a little sluggish this morning, but uh, so is everybody else. And you needs to warm up. one of the most idyllic spots for breakfast. We are on the old Spanish road. This road behind me used to be the only paved or gravel road across the Sahara built by the Spanish colonizers. Of course, the Moroccans left it as it is and they built their own road several kilometers from here, parallel with this one. It's time for a little bashkiri, a baguette. Enjoy the beautiful Saharan sunrise. After breakfast, we continue our southbound journey deeper into the heart of the Great Desert. The road takes us toward the Dakla Peninsula through breathtaking salt flats, sand, and rock formations. We have reached the classic Saharan camel watering spot. The nomads that you see here walk with their camels sometimes for weeks to reach a place like this where they pay for the watering rides and then they continue their journey onward. Uh -huh. Driving through Moroccan occupied Western Sahara requires frequent stops at military checkpoints. Although the movement of foreigners is tightly controlled, the guards are always friendly. Small gifts like cigarettes and pens can speed up anyone's journey. With this useful information, the Norwegians pass the checkpoint quickly, continuing toward the Mauritanian border. There isn't much to do or see here. The road is long. Teams only stop at the Tropic of Cancer sign to take a break. At 8 o'clock, half of the teams are already here. We're on the Moroccan Mauritanian border. The border is right on my left. It closes at 6 o'clock, so everybody has to wait here overnight. Teams are camping out here, right in front of the uh, border crossing. The line of cars at the border is over two kilometers long. The checkpoint opens at 9 a.m. Before arriving in Mauritania, teams have to cross a five kilometer long military buffer zone called No Man's Land. There are no paved roads or laws here. This land belongs to no country, but there is plenty of garbage, unexploded landmines, and danger all around. So taking the wrong turn can lead to disaster. You may end up in a minefield, or in a better case, just get stuck in sand. This happened to the 135 Renault from Serbia. Luckily, the lightweight little car can easily be pushed out of the sand's captivity. There's a lot of sand, a lot of cars are getting stuck. We got stuck and we burned a clutch. 
So this is what happens when you try to bring a Vespa into the desert. It's not exactly suitable, but uh, we're prepared. We have spare clutches and we're going to change it and we're going to be on the road in no time. We're done. <coughs> we should just wait and find a big, big truck of and then just drive behind it because yeah. the mm. big trucks, they know where they're going. Yeah, they we don't. They know the way. So somebody will find it and will turn off. Uh, I hope so. Don't give up. This guy's in quite a pickle right now. He just lost his waste bag with uh, all his cash, his passport, and, uh, and all his documents. So, And he's stuck in no man's land, which means he cannot go back to Morocco and he cannot go back into Mauritania. He's stuck here. It's Sunday and no one picks up the phone at the Norwegian consulate. He could be spending a week stuck between the two countries before a new passport and visa can reach him. His friend on the Mauritanian side asks for my advice. Should he stay there or should he go out and get somebody to smuggle him in? Somebody, somebody should smuggle him. You should answer to build us. Illegal border crossings can be dangerous, but somehow still sound more appealing than spending several days without food or water in no man's land. After going through the usual border formalities, we finally arrived in Mauritania, this bizarre North African country. Our bivouac, the camp, is about uh, 80 kilometers from the border, so it's going to be a short but sweet drive. Both the Vespa team and Louis Philip roll into camp at the same time. The human smuggling operation was a success too. An hour later, Trond Holbo appears on the horizon. A group of Hungarians smuggled him into Mauritania without a passport. Well, I told them the problem and uh, uh, basically they agreed to smoke me inside. Uh, so I was laying there, uh, <laughs> beside that wall, like this trying not to breathe at all, and uh, it went well, basically. Later on, I get a call that the man who stole his passport was arrested on the Moroccan side. This story could not have a happier ending. Finally a day when we don't have to start at seven or six o'clock in the morning. We had a comfortable, leisurely start from our desert camp here in Ulanoar. We have a 250 kilometer drive today on off-road and on-road stages. And we'll rendezvous with all the teams on the B2 beach, a beautiful virgin beach on the Atlantic coast. The trucks next to me that we're just passing, the charity trucks bringing the donations to Guinea-Bissau full of school supplies, medicines, clothing for children and other donations that participants of the rally have raised. The last rainy season was unusually strong in Mauritania, so this part of the desert is full of grass now. It's great news if you're a camel, but not if you're riding a scooter. The soft sand and the tough grass slows Joachim down. Luckily, the problem is not with the clutch. He needs to deflate his tires. The tire pressure, so we can drive here off road. It's, uh, the ground is very, very soft. Ready to go. Teams continue on bumpy grasslands and salt flats toward the beach. Around midday, I learn about the fate of the old Skoda from a passing Polish car. Ditch the Skoda, Skoda is finished. Completely gone, kaput. Bye, Skoda. Goodbye Skoda, beautiful Skoda is gone. It's been one hell of an adventure. The drive is relatively easy today through the coastal regions of northern and central Mauritania. However, the most demanding 50 meters of the race are inside this small fishing village. Here teams have to find the right place and the correct angle to enter the beach road. So this place, for example, the sand is hard, so you can speed up and hit the road there, but you may get stuck over there, so 
you have to check it out. The tide is still a little too high for us to drive on the beach, so we may have to wait, uh, I guess, another hour. The trick is to build up a lot of speed, keep the car in a low gear, and find the shortest sandy patch from the village to the beach. And this is what happens when people don't follow those instructions. These cars didn't build up proper speed, and they didn't find the right place to enter the beach. And this is what happened to them. Now they have to wait for a fishing truck, or they have to wait for the fishermen to get home and pull them out. The Vespa riders take the challenge head on with a little help from whoever's willing to push. All right, good job. Good job getting here. Is everybody okay? Yeah, sure. Your clutch is fine? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so listen, two things. Ride as close to the water as possible without getting wet, okay? Yeah. The further out you go, the more you'll get stuck, okay? Yeah. Stay by the water and make sure that the uh, salt water doesn't get into the engine and into a sensitive part, okay? Yeah. The most spectacular stretch of the rally awaits those who made it this far. By late afternoon, teams can relax and enjoy a well-deserved break at their desert beach camp. Yesterday was the scene of our annual beach party. Today we're staying here for another couple of hours. Uh, the low tide is coming around 1 o'clock, 1 1.30. So that's when the teams can get going. It's time to relax, chill out, and uh, get ready. Took a little swim. It was very cold, actually. A lot colder than I expected, but uh, it was nice to get a little bit of salty water and, uh, on our dirty bodies. This is also the time to do unavoidable repairs on the race cars. So the clutch is totally uh, does not release. So safety number one. Okay. Safety is number one. <laughs> Unfortunately the old Lada couldn't be cured. It had to be towed to the capital. Others left camp on their own wheels on a 120 kilometer ride to Nuakchot. This drive is usually a joy. It's the highlight of the rally. This year, because of all the dead seaweed, it uh, has turned into a bit of a nightmare. We got stuck in dead seaweed. This is the most disgusting thing that has ever happened to me on the Budapest Bomb. Luigi Philip is out of the mud, out of the, uh, the seaweed trap, and we are pushing on to Nuakchot. Right in front of me is the uh, Mauritanian army. Behind me is uh, part of our medical crew. You missed me by that much. Ah, oh. it will be fun. Mauritanian army almost just hit one of the uh, Vespa guys. Oh my god. Hey. The highlight of our day was spotting the Czech Polski Fiat and the Trabant, both of whom had dropped off the radar nine days ago in France. Ten days after we left Budapest, uh, we are rolling into uh, Nuakchot, the largest city inside the Sahara. Okay, here we are. This is the Aubert Sahara. Here. I'm dying to have a proper warm meal. It's been too long to eat dry bread and uh, Vashkiri cheese. It's 6.30 in Nuakchot. The city is still half asleep. We're about to get out of town, hitting the paved roads. Hopefully we'll be able to beat morning rush hour as we are heading further south on our journey towards the Senegalese border. We had to wait more than four hours in line to get on this ferry. 
The ferry crossing itself was two and a half minutes. Luckily, the paperwork is processed much faster on the Senegalese side. This is the team's first glimpse at Sub-Saharan Africa. What a difference a river makes. We're just uh, south of the Senegal River, and the landscape and the villages and everything else is completely different than in Mauritania. Tonight will be the rally's first night in a classic African bush camp. By sunrise, most teams are on the road again. The next two days will be difficult. They have to cross the entire country on dusty dirt roads. 700 kilometers of savanna bush driving are ahead of them. The organizers made navigation even more difficult by not giving out GPS coordinates. Participants have to use paper maps and get directions from the locals. What directions? So, Payar Laba? Straight? Or is Payar ici? No, Payar is Laba. Laba, okay. Prochain village? Ça fait 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers? Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Uh, itt nagyon-nagyon nehéz a tájékozódás. A mai nap folyamán például nem is kaptunk már meg koordinátákat, hanem ezeknek a picikek kis falvaknak a nevét kaptuk meg, amiket még kiejteni is elég nehéz egy, egy, egy normál ember számára. Members of the Vespa trio decided to play it safe again. They couldn't risk any more breakdowns in the bush. So they continued on a paved road to Guinea-Bissau. There's no stopping today. There's one scheduled break at the village of Velingara to give out donations. This is one of the sponsored villages of the rally. Every little pen, every little notebook makes a big difference here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have about 120 kilometers of savanna driving on narrow uh, dirt tracks today. Navigation is a bit of a problem, but my biggest concern right now is uh, my fuel. My tank is about one-third full. I'm uh, running out of fuel quickly, and uh, I can only hope and pray that I will get to a paved road before it runs out. Luckily, my car didn't run out of fuel, but the whole country did. Due to a general strike, all gas stations were closed. Teams had to find black market sellers. I managed to get my hands on some illegal fuel behind this market. Doesn't look like very high quality uh, fuel, but beggars can't be choosers. Those two guys behind me are pouring the gas from one uh, container to another, and everything is just super dirty, and there's dust in the air, and I'm sure there's plenty of sand in the gas. After two weeks of African travel, I have one pair of clean boxers. They will function as a little makeshift uh, fuel filter, if you will. Seems good quality, it's 98, super unleaded, premium. It's a textbook perfect African morning. Teams spend the night by the Gambia River in the company of monkeys, hippos and warthogs. There's not much time to enjoy nature. Men and machines have to get to Guinea-Bissau by sunset. The 250-kilometer stage starts at the Niokolo Koba National Park in Senegal. Long gone are the dry desert dirt roads of Morocco and Mauritania. Rivers, streams, forests and lush flora surround the drivers. With the new environment come new challenges. Then we head back to the red clay roads to make the final push to the border. This chain fence right in front of me marks the end of the country. Over there, it's Guinea-Bissau. Five minutes from the border crossing, I run into old friends. They seem exhausted. Very good. Everything okay? Yeah. The front, front tire exploded and... Uh, oh, I see. And I, uh, I fell on the side. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Here. My jacket worked as it should. It's falling on a motorcycle isn't a big problem because you always just slide 
along the tarmac, but meeting other cars is a dangerous thing. Yeah. And I had uh, I had a car this from my head when uh, when I crashed. So. Uh, and I thought the car had hit him. The entire village came out to greet the uh, 2012 Budapest Bamako as teams are dropping off some of their school supplies. There's a school for the 2,000 children living in the village, but only 30 of them go to school because they are lacking proper supplies and equipment. The school here in this village will receive lots and lots of aid and the uh, teams have already begun to drop off their donations. The party will go on well into the night. They have already killed two goats and I think a couple of more are on the way. Guinea-Bissau is one of the poorest countries in the world. Yet the generosity and the hospitality of the people along the way is mind-blowing. The ride to the capital is like one big party. While the vultures are cleaning up after last night's celebration in Sinchemboche, in towns like Gabu, people are welcoming the rally with dance and music. As a sign of their warm welcome, the local police even provided two motorcycles to escort teams to the finish line. This is a really happy moment, but I'm so tired. I'm too tired to be happy at this point. After driving 9,000 kilometers, there's our finish line. We're here in Bissau and we made it. We arrived. They made it, finally. They finally. I'm very tired, but uh, it's been good. It's been really good. We did it! Yes! Haha! How do you think I put it in the car? Huh? In the racing category, third place went to the German-Dutch team of always sick but never dies, aboard their orange Land Rover Defender. The Hungarian team of Mr. and Mrs. Zoltán Csányi came in close second behind the winners. For the second year in a row, the defending champions Janusz Turiani, Miklós Nagy and Tomáš Novák took the championship title once again.